On the night of August 14, 2002, Chris Thompson was helping his boss, Michael Short, carry out repairs on a vehicle. As the hour grew late, the two men decided to call it a night, with Chris promising to return the next morning to continue with the job. 50-year-old Michael Short was the owner of a mobile home moving business. He lived in the census-designated place of Oak Laval, Virginia, with his 36-year-old wife Mary and their 9-year-old daughter, Jennifer. After Chris Thompson returned to his motel for the night, Michael Short took his wife and child to Burger King for a late-night dinner in the nearby town of Collinsville. The family arrived home at some point between 11 and midnight. The following day, Chris Thompson arrived back at the Short household as promised. When he noticed his employer's garage door was open, Chris assumed that Michael Short had decided to get an early start on the truck job and had started the work without him. Upon entering the garage, Chris immediately saw Michael lying on a couch. It wasn't unusual for Michael to sleep in the garage as his terrible snoring often made it impossible for Mary to get any rest. When Chris went to awaken his employer though, he recoiled in horror. Michael Short wasn't sleeping, he was dead. This was no natural death though. Michael had been shot once in the head, execution style. Cops raced to the scene. They stormed the house and quickly found another body. Mary Short was found in her bed. Like her husband, Mary had been shot once in the head. Oak Laval is a tiny place. With a population of less than 1,000, it's somewhere where everybody knows everybody else. The officers on the scene didn't have to be told that the Shorts had a 9 year old daughter, but after sweeping the house several times, there was still no sign of Jennifer anywhere. It was possible that the killer or killers had abducted her, but authorities were hopeful that perhaps the little girl had awoken after hearing the gunshots that took the lives of her parents. It was suspected that she might have managed to escape the house and could have run into the woods at the rear of the property. Hundreds of officers from different law enforcement agencies, including the FBI, quickly descended upon the area. Over the course of two days, every inch of the woodland was searched with a fine tooth comb by the search party but their efforts proved to be fruitless. It was now looking more likely that Jennifer had been abducted. Inside the short home, investigators searched for evidence. Beside each body, they found spent 22 caliber shell casings. The killer or killers might have chosen such a small caliber weapon so as to avoid waking up whoever the second victim was. It was also discovered that the phone lines to the house had been cut which indicated that this was a premeditated crime and not something done on the spur of the moment. On a kitchen table, officers found hundreds of dollars in cash lying in plain view. This suggested that robbery was not a motive. Officers struggled to work out just why somebody would want Michael and Mary Short dead. Michael had employed many people over the years through his mobile home moving business and they asked Chris Thompson the worker who had discovered Michael's body, whether he was aware of any particularly disgruntled ex-employees. Chris Thompson, however, wasn't aware of any workers, current or former, who had any serious grievances with Michael. Investigators then wondered if Mary Short had been the killer's main target. They discovered that 10 years earlier, Mary had been harassed on multiple occasions by an unknown male. In 1992, Mary had been working as a seamstress in a clothing factory. On several occasions, a man had called at the factory, demanding to speak with Mary. Each time he was turned away, but the man was persistent. One day he unlawfully answered the factory's premises, once more insisting that he be allowed to see Mary. In the end, he had to be forcibly removed. The identity of this man was never ascertained. Jennifer Short was born just a year later. Investigators wondered whether this man was a scorned lover, and if that was the case, might this mystery man be Jennifer's real father? Had he killed Michael and Jennifer 
in order to be with his biological daughter. Just a week after being buried next to his wife, Michael Short's body was exhumed and a DNA sample was taken. It was proven that Michael Short was Jennifer's biological father, but the strange man could still not be ruled out as a suspect in the case. Next to nothing was known about him though. The workers at the factory had never seen him before and they didn't know his name. It was noted that he drove a white pickup truck, but nothing else was unearthed about him. Tellingly, on the day that the man had to be escorted off the clothing factory's premises, Mary had asked her employers not to call the police, which suggests that she did know the man on some sort of personal level, but the nature of their relationship remains a mystery to this day. With nine-year-old Jennifer Short still officially listed as a missing person, an Amber Alert was issued and her image was shared far and wide. Tips started to pour in from neighbouring states and even some from as far away as California from witnesses who were sure that they had seen the little girl. But none of these leads proved to be accurate. Days turned to weeks and still there was no sign of Jennifer. Then, on September 25th, a man living in Stoneville, North Carolina, noticed that his dog had unearthed something strange. At first, Eddie Albert thought that his dog was playing with a turtle shell. When he realised that it was in fact a fragment from a human skull, Eddie dialed 911. Investigators working on the case in Oak Level made the one hour drive to Stoneville to view the scene for themselves. Over the course of three days, more remains were found in and around a small pond on Eddie Albert's property. They would eventually be identified as belonging to Jennifer Short. Like her mother and father, Jennifer Short had been shot once in the head. Although the detectives and FBI agents working on the case were devastated to learn that Jennifer was dead also, they hoped that the discovery of her remains might lead to her killer. It appeared to be the case that Jennifer had been tossed over a nearby bridge. It wasn't a stretch to believe that her killer might live nearby. As officers got to work on questioning people who lived near the scene, they came across a mobile home. Of course, Michael Short had owned a mobile home moving business. Detectives wondered if there might be a connection. Sure enough, the owner of the mobile home, a man by the name of Gary Bowman, was already on their radar. Gary's landlord had called a tip line in the days after Michael and Mary Short were found shot dead in their home. He said that the 66 year old had told him about paying a man in Virginia to move his mobile home, but he hadn't done so. The landlord claimed that Gary had said if the man didn't do the job soon, he was going to kill him. The tipster had thought Bowman to be speaking flippantly and didn't seriously believe that anybody's life was in danger at the time. Crucially, Gary Bowman never actually mentioned Michael Short by name when speaking with his landlord. The day after the murders, Gary Bowman brought his mobile home to the property of a friend about one mile away from where Jennifer's remains would be discovered six weeks later and fled to northern Canada. Detectives didn't have any problem securing search warrants for both Bowman's mobile home and the house he had been renting. These searches uncovered just one piece of evidence, but it was more than enough to suggest to investigators that they were on the right path. A map belonging to Gary Bowman was noticed to have an X marked upon it. The spot where Bowman had marked on his map was a four lane highway that ran parallel to Michael and Mary Short's house. Gary Bowman was now suspect number one. When detectives reached out to their counterparts north of the border, they were delighted to hear that Bowman had been arrested on drink driving charges and was currently in custody in the city of Yellow Knife. Investigators had feared that Bowman was on the run and would be near impossible to track down in Canada. It would take a few weeks for Bowman to be extradited back to the US and during that time, some information came to light that seemed to pour cold water on the theory that it was he who was behind the Short family massacre. A friend of Bowman's had come forward to state that he was with him on the night of the murders. According to this friend, Bowman was so drunk when he left him that night that there was simply no way he could have driven to Oak Level and carried out a triple homicide. 
The fact that Gary Bowman had eloped all the way to northern Canada the day after the murders was also seen as strong evidence pointing to his guilt. But according to those who knew him, Bowman had been saying for a long time that he wanted to move to Canada's northern territories. Upon arriving back in the United States, Gary Bowman was immediately called in for questioning. He flat out denied ever telling his landlord that he was going to kill a man in Virginia, saying that no such conversation took place. Gary seemed convincing in his denials, but it should be noted that Gary's landlord was asked to take a polygraph test and passed with flying colours. When confronted with the map that had an axe marked upon it on a spot close to the Short family home, Bowman stated that he knew nothing about it. Bowman suggested that it might have been his ex-wife who made the mark, as she often attended a flea market in that area. Investigators looked into this and discovered that yes, there was indeed a flea market close to the spot marked with an axe on the map. Gary Bowman eventually slipped from detectives radar. Weeks turned to months turned to years and still nobody was charged with the Short family massacre. In 2009, the FBI released a sketch of a possible suspect. According to the FBI, numerous witnesses had seen this man sitting in a white truck close to the Short home on the night of the murders. Was this the same man? who had tried to accost Mary Short at the factory where she had worked 10 years before her murder. The same man who had left the scene in a white truck. Nobody knows. To this day, the slayings of Michael, Mary and Jennifer Short remain a mystery. Anybody with information is encouraged to call the following number. <laughs>